welcome to the Stittsville Rotary Club's Mental Health Webinar Series. My name is Michael Dixon. I'm a very proud Rotary uh, member, and I'm honored to be your host this evening. I would like to begin this evening by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishpeg people. The Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. The Rotary Club of Stittsville was founded in 2004. We are members of a worldwide organization called Rotary International. As Rotarians, we support our community as well as many projects around the world. One worldwide project that you might be aware of is the eradication of polio. Rotary International, along with our partners around the world, including world governments, the World Health Organization, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, have been able to successfully accomplish this goal. Locally, the Stittsville Club has developed a place for quiet meditation in the W.J. Bell Rotary Peace Park. Fundraising in support of new developments at the Dave Smith Youth Treatment Center, the Stittsville and Richmond Food Banks. So please contact us through our website if you are interested in becoming a member or you would like more information on our club and what we do in, in your community at info at stittsvillerotary.com. So let me just run through the way this presentation will be run this evening. First, at any time, <clears throat> if you feel uncomfortable by our discussion, please reach out to one of the helpful phone numbers we will be providing in the comments section of your screen. Questions can be asked by two methods tonight. You can type your questions in during the presentation to me privately. Or, or publicly if you wish. And I will ask the questions to the presenters at the end of all the presentations during the question and answer portion of the evening. You can also press the reaction button on your screen and a hand will come up beside your name. So if you, yeah, the uh, hand will, will uh, come up beside your name and uh, you can ask your question to one of the, per, uh, the presenters directly. You know, you can now see that your mics have been muted. They will be unmuted during the Q&A section. If you wish, you can activate your camera, or if you'd rather have a blank screen, that's fine too. Now, please note during these presentations, the presentations will be under the province of Ontario guidelines. So if you're outside of Ontario, we would ask you to contact your province, state, or country officials. Tonight's presentation will be recorded and will be available on the Stittsville Rotary website for future reference. Now, tonight we'll be touching on a, on a subject that has affected all of us at one time. As a child or a teenager, you know, we have all wondered, why am I so angry or sad? Am I always gonna feel this way? Would anybody really miss me if I was gone? And as a parent or a caregiver, I'm sure I know for a fact that we've all lied in bed, staring at the ceiling thinking, are the kids okay? Crossroads Children's Mental Health Center is Ottawa's community leader in developing and delivering a range of individualized mental health services solely for the children under the age of 12 and their loved ones in crisis and need of support. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce the executive director of Crossroads Children's Mental Health Center, Mr. Michael Holm. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you for that. No problem. So I'm just going to transition us over to a slide uh, deck, and then I'm going to 
sort of start speaking to stuff. So thank thank you for the introduction and a big thanks for giving us an opportunity to come and, and speak with you all. Uh, I'm looking forward to presenting a little bit on Crossroads and also looking forward to hearing from Kevin, who's going to speak next, and also Elise, uh, my co-presenters. So um, for tonight, what I'm going to do is cover off what who is Crossroads, talk a little bit about trauma and stress, um, and also how do you notice stress response and what do you do about those particular stress responses? That will be my focus throughout the evening. So for Crossroads, just um, in terms of who we are, we, we do um, provide children's mental health services to kids from birth to, to 12 and their families. We individualize all of our services, and that really means we, we spend time assessing with, with the parent and with the child from time to time what the needs are of the family, and then develop from that a, uh, whatever the service might be, a treatment plan, including the family as full participants in the process. And that could be the parents in the home, could be grandparents, could be other, other important folks that are in the child's life. Uh, we, we do promote early identification and intervention, and that's sort of obvious from our birth to, to six population. So we do a lot of work in that area as well. We provide our services within the least restrictive environments. And so that's typically in a client's home, sometimes in the school. And our, our approach is uh, founded on collaborative problem solving. So in essence, we believe challenging kids lack the skill, not the will to succeed. So there's something that's getting in the way from them doing well. And part of what we do is help identify what that is and then help sort through what those particular skills are and teach up to those, to those skills. So for instance, being able to delay gratification, being able to manage frustration tolerance, all of those are skill sets that often are lacking for kids who are exhibiting challenging behavior, both uh, internalized and externalized behaviors. So we also, so as a, a service, we have walk-in services, we have in-home treatment service. Um, and again, in-home treatment is set up at times that are convenient for the family and, and could be one to three times per week, depending upon severity. We offer child and family therapy, so child therapy and family therapy. Uh, where appropriate. Uh, we run parent groups. We have a, a number of school-based programs. And then we, uh, we offer some specialized assessments where appropriate and typically just for kids that are within the programs that we're, we're working in. So that's kind of who we are and what we do. So in terms of trauma and stress, so uh, the key, key piece here to sort of highlight is obviously the pandemic and, and all of the changes that have happened and the stress and everything that's going on creates a, a significant amount of trauma and stress. And that'll vary depending upon the child and, and family, obviously, in, in terms of the impact of that trauma and, and the stress responses that go, go from there. So... Uh, first and foremost, trauma is a response to an event. It's not the event itself. So in other words, two people can experience the exact same event and have two very different outcomes from that particular event. Um, often that's impacted by the child's own history, previous experiences, and how those events were experienced for the child and how they were managed uh, during whatever the episode was. Proximity and exposure to the event, so loss of a loved one, for instance, uh, and being sort of uh, obviously close to that, it will have more of an impact in terms of the, of the event than if someone else witnessed it and didn't lose somebody in that particular event. And then also what happened after the event matters. So other, other people's reactions uh, to the situation will either um, create more of a challenge for the child in terms of man managing that, that uh, traumatic event, um, or it'll actually make it better depending upon, on, upon the circumstances in, in terms of being able to manage the outcome from, from that traumatic event. So importantly here, some children will show signs of traumatic stress in response to the pandemic, while others won't. And again, no one size doesn't fit all, so it'll really vary depending upon the, the situation and some of those factors that I noted just above in terms of being impacted by. So in terms of stress response uh, and our stress response system, it's really, it's a, in, in, a, in a many ways, it's a form of communication that something is wrong, something's going on. And so, and, and that actually applies equally to behavior. So if a child's demonstrating some um, externalizing behavior, so stuff that you can actually see or internalizing behavior, it's, it's telling 
us as adults, something's up, and that should highlight for us that we need to, to, to dig in deeper and figure out what's going on. So at home, ways to recognize fight, um, and that's sort of as a, uh, typically in a stress response, you have a fight, flight, or a freeze response. I'll talk a little bit about another response in a, in a minute, but focusing right now on fight, flight, or freeze. In terms of fight, that's the outward stuff. So you see the hitting, kicking, punching, hit, uh, spitting, a number of different things that might happen. Arguing with siblings or caregivers, so um, you know, automatic nose to things, making sort of your life as a parent really challenging. Um, that that could be a sign of of fight as a response to whatever this whatever stressors are going on for the child, and that's inside the pandemic time frame and outside of the pandemic stress response often is that form of communication. Flight also is a possibility. And so kids uh, that are, are more, more likely to present with flight response are often going to run away from the situation, including like physically running away from home, uh, running out of the school, running out of whatever activity they're in as part of their flight response. Could be uh, as simple as hiding behind and under things. And, and or you might notice uh, an incapacity to sit still and can't relax. So they're just constantly fidgeting. And, and it would be really sort of an abnormal kind of situation, um, uh, not under pressure where you'd see that sorts of be those sorts of behaviors. Freeze in the home uh, could be just spacing out, um, become even more frozen during transitions and not being able to actually progress through whatever the transition is, either, you know, coming down from... Uh, from bedtime, you know, going outside, those sorts of transitions that might be really challenging for the particular kid to do. Not being able to start or complete basic chores or tasks or complaints of physical symptoms of distress. So tummy ache, headaches, dizziness, those sorts of things that you would hear from your child. That's, that's uh, highlighting that there might be a stress response happening here in the context of freeze. So what do you do with that? Uh, and these are just some ideas. There's a, a plethora of different ones. And obviously you'd line up these ideas based on the age and, and sort of developmental level of the child that you're, you're, uh, you have. So basically if it's fight, you could have them do some deep breathing exercises, get the child moving. So swing, swinging, climbing, mo some motion type activity. Uh, give the child an important task to do, um, um, allow for chewing foods, hot chocolate, warm bath, all of those types of things will help soothe and calm the child's um, stress system such that they'll be able to be present and be able to, you know, be able to reason with them. Because uh, another thing that's really important to keep in mind, if someone is in a stress response, either hyperarousal or hypoarousal stress response, you're not going to do a whole lot of engaging in conversations that are that are going to be overly helpful when they're in that state so you need to bring them down to a level where you can actually have a conversation and find out what's going on from the particular kid if your child if you think your child's in the flight response keep the child close by you obviously don't want them running away especially uh, the younger ones and even sort of older ones uh, weighted lap blankets are good, soft toys, um, giving the child an easy familiar task to do, crunchy foods, carrots, all that sort of that, that movement motion uh, and noise will help sort of bring down uh, some kids from a flight response. If you feel they're freezing, you can just be present with the child, make sure that they know that you're there. Uh, have them dig in mud, sand. There's different, all kinds of different activities you can do around that. Get the child moving, sort of climbing, hanging, jumping, trampoline, watching TV. Again, hot chocolate toast, a favorite for many of the kids that we work with. Uh, as some of the the responses, and obviously there's a lot. There's a lot more that you can use, and and you would know best, obviously based on on the, your child what would what's going to actually work. But they would fit into these three gap categories typically. Another response and another form of communication is the collapse. So that's a, a fourth part. So recognizing collapse in the home. So the child actually collapses in the core in the corner, as it appears as if they're not listening or daydreaming, slows down, sleepy, really into people pleasing, unable to get out of bed in the morning, unable to play and ready to love others. So it's a little bit like the the freeze, but this is sort of even, even more challenging and, and hard to deal with, but some ideas uh, to manage that include Lego, Play-Doh, and again, you're doing this uh, developmentally appropriate, whatever the activities might be. The weighted lap blanket, again, comes in handy. 
giving the child simple repetitive things to do is so that, you know, repetitive patterned activities is a, is a fantastic way to bring uh, us as adults, as well as kids into a more calm state, especially when, when faced with stressors. Um, being quiet and present, swinging, warm pajamas, all of those will help sort of calm the child who's in that, in that particular state. So other strategies for supporting kids at home include, and there's a, again a plethora of these, and these will these also will help uh, calm the stress. Some of you've already heard, others you wouldn't have. So provide the greatest possible feeling of safety and security is really critical. So ideas include uh, finding a time of day to connect daily and making that a purposeful, regular, routine uh, part of your your week with your child. Provide predict predictable structures and routines. I'm also just going to jump down to set clear and developmentally realistic expectations too, because the routines and structures that you set have to be developmentally realistic expectations. So as you're um, and rules and routines. So as you're thinking about your child, don't think about them strictly from the chronological age that they are. So it's not that they're just eight years old. You got to also think about where they're at developmentally. So some eight-year-olds are functioning more at a five-year-old level. That would be the developmental level. And so you would set expectations, structure, and routines at that age level rather than the eight-year-old level. And you would incrementally grow those as the child gets better at the at, at developmentally at those particular expectations. So you look for ways to prevent difficult situations rather than punishing. So that's a lot of the distraction piece um, um, so that you're not in the place of having to, to discipline. And then provide options or choices for the child if the child can actually uh, handle that. The one I missed here is limit news media input from young kids. So I'm sure you guys have noticed, uh, I certainly noticed with, with who we work with and, and uh, you know, even people in my own home where, you know, we've got the news on, everybody seems to hear everything that's happening and especially everything that's negative that's happening. And again, that just fuels some of that stress and potentially trauma depending upon uh, the experiences of the child and or adults around them. Another is to support children in becoming aware of and able to express their emotions. And this goes back to, if you recall at the very outset, I talked about kids do well if they can. Um, and that's typically because there's a skill set that's lacking that gets in the way of them doing well. And so in this instance, it's often being able to express their, their emotions or their thoughts, concerns, and needs into words. And so part of what um, we can do as adults is to help them. And some of those ideas is read books together, find um, emotional pieces within that book and talk about those and get the kid to express, use play. Notice nonverbals, tune into the cues, cues, be a role, role model, obviously, and listen. Um, listen for opportunities to, to help the child express their, their emotions. And then help children learn, uh, become aware of what it feels like to be calm, identify and practice activities that soothe throughout the day. So those uh, activities I talked about earlier, um, it's good to get a set that you know your child's going to be able to use and then practice them uh, even outside of the moments where they're stressed so that they get used to using those particular uh, activities, whatever you landed on. So incorporating regulating movement throughout the day, which includes regular outdoor play, is, is pretty key. And uh, we do know, and there's a lot, a lot of neuro, uh, on the neuroscience around this, that, that repetitive uh, patterned uh, back and forth kind of activities. So those regulating movement based activities are really helpful for kids to keep calm and also develop skills as they go. Uh, also including calming activities or reg regular intervals throughout the day. So breathing exercises, yoga, depending upon, obviously depending upon your child uh, and what you think is going to work best. And it's often wise, especially, uh, you know, if they can do this developmentally is to engage your child in, in coming up with some of these ideas as part of what it is that they'd like to, to try out to keep calm and, and relaxed when, when in that stress state. And then lastly, just to, to there'll be more information later, I'm sure, but to contact us, you can do that directly through counselingconnect.org or through crossroadschildren.ca. So there's ways to, and actually you can just go to crossroadschildren.ca and that will allow for you to book in an appointment if you need to, to speak to somebody. If these ideas that I've just sort of covered aren't working and things are more, uh, you know, 
more challenging, then definitely uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, if you're in the Ottawa area. Nicole, that was uh, that was excellent. Kevin Cluche is the executive director of Open Doors for Lanark Children and Youth. Open Doors make it possible for Lanark children and youth with mental health needs to live, learn, and thrive. Open Doors provides mental health services, including assessment, treatment, and follow-up for youth up to 18 years of age, and their families experiencing significant social, emotional, or behavioral difficulties. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the Executive Director of Open Doors for Lanark Children and, and Youth, Kevin Kluche. Well, Michael, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here this evening and uh, just want to acknowledge that you've made a, an excellent choice as the Rotary Club of Stittsville to host this event on Mental Health Week, the first, the first night, and uh, it's our absolute pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, get have my, our tech um, guru, Chris, uh, help me with this, a couple of polls that I'm going to ask people and invite your participation. It's, it's, it's all uh, going to be um, uh, without awareness of who is voting on, on what particular point. But we just want to get a feel for, uh, a little bit for, for the room. And, and uh, Chris, could I get you to put up the first poll, please, while I uh, pull up my slide deck? Uh, the first poll is, is uh, available to us, so we can see the uh, kind of people um, with regard to their, their families, whether they have uh, children uh, or teens in their family. And I wanted to, uh, Chris, if I could also ask you right now to put up the second poll. And uh, just ask a simple question. The reason that you might be attending this, uh, are, are you interested in mental health challenges in the, in the uh, pandemic? Uh, do you currently have a teen who's having struggles? Um, or are you looking to prevent such things as happening? And uh, um, again, that'll just help us to understand a little bit about who it is that we're, we're chatting with. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so Michael has already told you a little, little bit about us. Um, so I'll, uh, and we're very similar to Mike's, uh, uh, Michael's um, uh, organization, uh, Crossroads, uh, only we work to the age of 18. And we are in Lanark County with uh, offices in Smith Falls, Perth and, and uh, Carleton Place. And we work in people's homes and schools just as his organization that does. And we're more than happy to, uh, to work with you uh, should the opportunity uh, become necessary. Um, one of the things that we've learned uh, through research during the pandemic is that uh, some of the people who are having the toughest time of it right now are adolescents and young adults. And, and uh, what I want to uh, chat with you this evening is to hopefully um, share some information with regard to uh, the reasons for that. And hopefully you'll understand uh, a little bit closer toward the end of the program. And also some things that you might be able to do to be able to um, avert issues as they uh, perhaps come to the attention of, of you and, and your family. And I just want to start off by saying, you know, there, there's so many things in our life that we that we have uh, uh, rituals uh, that we've we've established in our lives. We have graduation ceremonies, we have marriage ceremonies, we have funerals, and they're all intended to mark a transition from one stage to the next. And we have many cultural and religious uh, uh, celebrations that acknowledge the rite of passage or coming of age from childhood to, to adulthood. A few that come to mind are uh, confirmations, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, uh, sweet sixteens even. And we also uh, consider rites of passage like getting a, uh, a, a driver's license, uh, being able to vote at 18, and the age of majority. Um, so, um, wait a minute, let's see. You can vote at 18, you receive your bat mitzvah or bar mitzvah at, at 13, you're the age of majority at 19, 
So when is it that a person actually comes of age? Well, um, it's, it's, it's not an, an easy question because adolescence isn't an event. It actually is a, li a living process. It's, it's something that lands between childhood and adulthood. And it describes uh, an age of coming of age, but there's no demarcations that really say it's now, it's not now, it's the next time. So there's political decisions that tell us you're an adolescent, you're an adult. Uh, there's religious roots that inform us about, about what this transition is all about. Um, and still others look at physiological and neurological changes that happen. So suffice it to say that there's numerous definitions of what adolescence actually is, about when it begins and when it ends. And with all that said, um, it, we do know that it's a tremendous uh, uh, time of change whenever, whenever uh, a person is growing, maturing, and moving through adolescence. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We know there's a lot of physiological, hormonal, neurological, psychological, emotional, and social things uh, happening simultaneously. And we know that the brain is just um, having all kinds of changes happening to it, and it's happening rapidly. You know, what some of the things that are going on is that um, uh, the, the, the brain is, is changing the way that an individual's decision-making is happening and the kinds of choices uh, that, they're, that they're making. Um, have you ever noticed that uh, if you have a if you have an adolescent in your home or or um, have had one, that one day they make the most astonishingly mature decisions, and you're just like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that actually happened, and then the next day it's like, what happened? They're back to acting like a ten year old again. Don't understand what's going on. Well, there's a really good reason for all of that. See, the brain is, as I mentioned, really going through changes. And the part of the brain that they were using as a child to make decisions and move forward and, and understand the way the world is happening is beginning to be pruned. The, the neural pathways are, are, are being disconnected from that part of the brain as they are beginning to develop their neocortex, which is the front of the brain, which is the, the part of the brain that is, that is responsible for um, reasoning, uh, understanding consequences, and problem solving. So while something at the rear of the brain is becoming less involved, the pre, um, sorry, the, uh, the prefrontal cortex is becoming more and more engaged. And while that's happening, well, they're relying more on, on a very old part of the brain called the amygdala that's responsible for the things like impulses and emotions and instincts, the kinds of things that uh, Michael was mentioning about f freeze, flight, and uh, uh, fight uh, to be able to uh, help them make the transition. So there's all kinds of different processes going on that are making it very challenging for them to be the same way day after day after day. They're evolving, they're maturing. Excuse me. <laughs> so you can understand with all these changes happening at the neurological level that you might, as a parent or a caregiver, feel kind of helpless. Like, you don't have direct access to the brain, do you? It's not like you can go in and help move things around more quickly. And you're not, and you're not, have, you're not going to have to be uh, reactive until they have finished this process uh, of maturing. Um, there are reason, things that you can do and reasons that you can do them to be able to assist them to mature and to be able to move through these processes easily. And the first thing I wanna to mention to you is that, well, let's face it, they're adolescents, so you've done a good job already, haven't you? They've made it through childhood. Congratulate yourselves, you've done a wonderful job. Do you believe in your parenting? You should, because they're already adolescents and you've done a fabulous job of getting to there. You've raised them, you've fed them, you've cleaned them, you've been parenting to protect them. No. Don't play in the street. Do not put that fork in the light socket. You've gotten them to the age that they are now adolescents, and that's fabulous. Congratulate yourselves. It's all been going so well. And then without so much as a rite of passage, the rules changed. No one told you. 
No one gave you advance notice. Suddenly, whenever you try to parent to protect, well, they rail against the tyranny of your parenting. They go underground. Uh, where are you going? I don't know. Who are you going with? I don't know. And they don't share information with you anymore. And what's going on is that they want to be with their peers more than they want to be with you. And you're, and you're wondering what's going on here. Well, they're moving into the stage of being able to move towards a higher level of functioning, which is known as adolescence. So um, your parenting to protect isn't working anymore. So let's switch up the game and call it parenting to prepare. There, whoops, I got to go back. So parenting to prepare. Oh, uh, it's going to help them to achieve their, their mandate, which is to grow, to seek independence, to form their own identity, and to make choices and become increasingly independent. That's what you've been working so hard for. And in spite of all the changes that are going on, there are things that you can do to make it uh, as as painless and as smooth and as comfortable as possible for everyone involved. So um, you've done well. Um, and one of the reasons that you've done well is that you created rules. Rules are very important. They, they create predictability and they create uh, um uh, a sense of structure within within your family. And although you haven't even been thinking about it, perhaps, or maybe you have, you've been doing this all based on values. The values that, that define who you are, what your family is, and what you stand for. And the very same sorts of things will happen whenever you are helping a child to grow through adolescence. Um, you've laid a strong foundation, and now you have to balance it between parenting to prepare, parenting to protect. Hey, we don't want you drinking alcohol. You're too young for that. But if you make a mistake, give us a call. We'll come and get you. So let them know that you're there to cut. To, you've got their back. You can communicate what's important, taking care of each other, our family and relationships, and help them to understand what the rules are. So one thing you want to remember to do, though, is to put the rules in as positive a sense as possible. There's a difference between you can watch TV when your homework's done. It, it, that's a very different message from the one that says no TV until you finish your homework. You know, when you're thinking about uh, getting to the desired behavior, the first one does a very good job. The second one creates barriers and invites power struggles that you really don't want to get into. Parents never win power struggles. Kids always do. The, what the role that you want to do is to help them to learn about themselves, their potential, their resilience, and their real ability to create meaning in their own world and life. And that's creating identity. So I want to bring your, your, you to uh, an area of research that's, that's been very influential, and that's the uh, whole idea of growth mindset. And it seems that whenever people are given an opportunity to learn, whenever they develop a sense that they are going to expand themselves through uh, learning and experience, and that they're going to be, uh, even if it doesn't work out right the first time, they're going to have an opportunity to continue to grow. It's something that really builds their sense of self and their sense of their decision making and their ability to do well in their life. Those with a fixed mindset. Well, they kind of see, I won the game, and no, I don't want to play again because I might lose. It's good enough that I won. So they kind of contain themselves for fear of not being able to be as good as they once were, or at least in one experience. So remember that your, your, your child is, is developing and that adolescence is a prime stage of development. So what you want to do is help them to learn and to better in the face of adversity. And we'll get to the pandemic as an adversity in just a few minutes. So you want to help your child become responsible and accountable by offering them choice. If they choose to come in late for the curfew, then you go with it and you let them know, you know what? It doesn't seem like you're able to handle that kind of kind of responsibility right now through your behavior. So we're going to do exactly what you asked for by coming in late. And we're going to take that responsibility from you because that seems to be too much for you at this time. And when you show us you can do, do better, because we love you and we care about you, 
will gladly give you more responsibility in a way that that you can manage it and handle it. Show them that 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 you can follow their lead and give them additional responsibilities. You're not the one deciding. You're basing it upon their behavior. <laughs> Excuse me. They lead, they need to learn how to navigate all those temptations throughout their lives. And if they mess up, well, they're not failures. It's just a learning opportunity so that they think if they can continue to grow. Um, let's see. Uh, so by assisting them by parenting to prepare, you provide them with the supports they require, the opportunities to learn, and the skills with which they can be successful. It could take a heart-to-heart -heart talk. It could take uh, an opportunity in which you want to show them respect you want to be able to model that respect for them because they're watching they're, they're watching how adults problem solve and and get through the tough periods and um sorry um they, they want to be able to learn from you about how to manage all these things with uh with creativity and sensitivity so um want to put up uh, um let's see uh, Chris, could I get you to put up poll number four, please? And this question, we're just going to ask you, what are some of the things that you're doing now that would be uh, um, helping to create the kind of relationship that you want with, with, uh, with your adolescents right now? And you can pick one of them, all of them, none of them, whatever makes the most sense in your particular circumstance. So um, in review, we know that we know that uh, there's a lot of physiological, neurological, social, psychological, emotional changes that are happening simultaneous with their youth, with your youth, and that you are a sense of, or, or you are a source of, uh, guidance, strength, and relationship in order to help them to be able to navigate through all these challenges. So it's not just them; it's about you as well and how you are as a parent. Now, um, they're not alone. You don't need to have them go through this all, all by themselves. And by understanding that that relationship is key to, to mental health, uh, uh, key to um, uh, the mental health of your adolescent, um, it's really important that you remain connected. Reach out to them. Get into conversations with them. Understand what it's like from their perspective to be going through all of this through the pandemic. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, um, perhaps a good place to begin is to recognize that that a protective factor is being able to rate, relate to them in a very meaningful way. Um, and connectedness really means that they understand that somebody really cares about them. Somebody really wants them to do well and has and has their best interests at heart. You know, the research says that those those youth who have um, uh, parents and other adults who demonstrate that they really care about them are up to 66 percent less likely to get in, to experience a mental health problem, to engage in violence, to engage in risky sexual behavior or to experiment with drugs. Um, so how do you do that? Well, you get involved in their life. You open, you you, you openly communicate with them often. Uh, speak about, for instance, their use of masks. Um, what's their views about it? How do they feel about having to wear a mask? You can share your concerns about their health and safety, and and that this is something that you want, you would hope that they would do because, or you want them to do, because it's one thing that is going to keep them safe. Explore their perception. Um, offer them choices about the kind of mask that they would wear and the color of it, and be certain to be clear about the expectation is that this is a rule within the family because our value is to take care of each other. When the kind of conversation concludes, just express your appreciation for their sh willingness to share their point of view and uh, that they were able to listen to yours. So connect, engage, invite perspectives, let them know you care about them. Um, now, one of the biggest challenges is that you have youth who are supposed to be individuating, right? Going out with their peers, staying away from uh, staying away from family because they're they're uh, creating their own sense of identity and, and, and sorry, individuating. So, 
fun, again, do the same sort of thing. Chat with them. How hard is it to be your age and you want to hang out with your buds and here you are sitting here with us? Engage them in a conversation and share with them uh, uh, an opportunity so that they can join with you and you can empathize with them and understand what's going on. You can co-create solutions that, that would be acceptable within your values and with, with the rest of the family. Here's a simple one you can do. Laughing. Did you know that laughing is really good for mental health? Laughing is laughing together is yes, it's connectedness, but it raises our moods, increases our satisfaction, and releases neuropeptides that are associated with uh, stress management. Find a way to laugh together. Be a family that that has a good chuckle, and everybody's going to be doing better. Um, there are other ways that we can elevate our mood. Um, at the end of the day. Notice three things for which you are grateful. Yeah, you couldn't see your friends, I understand. <laughs> Excuse me, you've been in the house with us all day. What if, I'm really grateful though that you helped out with dinner. I'm really grateful that you took care of your little brother while I had to continue with my Zoom meeting uh, deep into the night. And you know what? I really just really appreciate that you're here to help out. I'm grateful for that. What are you grateful for? Help them to want to focus on what's positive that's going on in their world. Hey, is your pro, your team prone to anxiety? Here's something you can try. It's called square breathing. You know, if you inhale for a count of five, you hold your breath for a count of five, you exhale for a count of five, and you don't inhale for a count of five. Well, why would that be helpful? Well, because anxiety is a really good tool that we have within our within our body that warns us of danger and when someone is feeling uh anxiety it's because there's a threat well we can't go and fight the saber-toothed tiger like we used to where we can't run through the fields but what we can do is communicate between our body and our minds that the risk is gone and when we slow down our breathing we inform our brains that you know what um, I don't have to breathe shallow because I don't have to get ready to fight or take flight or to to freeze. Everything's okay. We can just get on the way that we were. And finally, I just want to mention that one of the things that we can do is get out. You know, there's a huge benefit to being outside, to going for walks, to going walking through trails. Mental health and physical activity are highly associated for positive outcomes. Um, so, uh, walking, riding, uh, uh, depressive symptoms and low feelings are benefited through physical activity. So, um, I just wanted to, uh, uh, whoops, now I've done it. Um, I just wanted to share with you some of the tools that, uh, you can take, you can take in order to assist your, your adolescent. It's difficult for them because they are having challenges, because developmentally they're supposed to be individuating. And there are things that you can do that help, that can help them to deal with the challenges of social isolation, with social distancing, that, that can make a big difference in them by helping them to feel like somebody really cares and you are the people who are doing that. Um, I've, I've messed up. I'm now in a pencil and I can't move on. Man, I've never had so much trouble with a slide deck. We'll just we'll we'll just leave it at that, okay? Because what I was going to do in my last slide was just sort of do a, a, a grand conclusion of what it is that uh, we just discussed. However, I will say this: if your child, if your youth is is having challenges and you've done all of these things and they're still having a difficult time, by all means, reach out to a professional, your doctor. Open Doors, Crossroads, other, other children's mental health centers so that you can derive the benefit of working with somebody to help you to help your child. That's it, Michael. Thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, um, it's been uh, great to be here. That's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, you know, I find sometimes as uh, as parents, we're uh, we're a little too hard on ourselves sometimes, and uh, you know, when it's okay to not have the answers when your you know child comes at you with the question. 
Well, again, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, Elise Scheiper is the executive director of Parents Lifeline of Eastern Ontario. They are a non-profit family peer support organization for parents whose children are to the age of 25 that are facing mental health challenges. They provide family peer support through integrated services specifically designed to support parents when, where, and how they need it the most and to work together so that parents can move seamlessly between them. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the Executive Director of Parents Lifeline of Eastern Ontario, Elise Scheiper. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks everyone for attending tonight. I know sometimes adding another couple hours of Zoom seems uh, impossible after the way we're working these days. And also a huge thank you to Kevin and to and to Michael. As a parent, I always learn so much um, from, from you guys and the work that you're doing. And I find it so helpful, not just to get the tools, but also to have the context to kind of understand what's going on with my son or uh, with the other kids that are part of my life to, to understand. I know their behavior is communication, but it's so helpful to understand what might be going on with them. Um, in terms of their development to make to make sense of it. So I so appreciate that. So I'm going to round out the part of the session tonight talking more about the role that parents play. And throughout the presentation, I'll use the word parents as a broad term that encompasses probably everyone here. So parents, caregivers, grandparents, uh, trusted adults that work with and support kids and youth really any one of us that's part of that big, important parenting role. And my goal is that you leave here feeling validated, a little hopeful, better informed, and also empowered. Well, let's start first with a 30 second break. So I wanna encourage you to take just 30 seconds, take a deep breath, acknowledge that in the midst of everything going on, you made the time and effort to be here tonight. And by the time we wrap up, you'll be better informed, better able to support yourself and your family. And this is worth a moment of recognition and gratitude for yourself. And to feel a little hope that you are better equipped now than you were even one hour ago. There's a lot going on right now, which is the understatement of the year. So if it feels hard, it's not because you're doing it wrong. So let that sink in for a minute. If it feels hard, it's not because you're doing it wrong. This next slide is one I use to describe what parents are normally undertaking outside of a crisis situation, which is really what we're in right now with this pandemic. Humans are remarkably resilient and adaptive. And let's just acknowledge for ourselves that this pandemic is a marathon crisis. So you'll see in this slide, I've had to add a whole extra line of the roles that parents are playing right now. When your child is struggling, you have to be an advocate. You have to learn how to present the information in the language and lingo of health, education, and a justice system. You have to be a case manager. You have to connect all of the dots uh, between doctors, teachers, psychiatrists, and so on. You have to be a system navigator, helping to find the person or program or service that might work for your child and family. A researcher, reading every book and article about a diagnosis or attachment parenting or orchid children, and, and trying to piece the information together yourselves. You have to be a crisis responder, talk your child out of a locked bathroom, uh, stand in front of other children to protect them in a violent outburst. You have to be a record keeper, keeping binders and binders of notes on medications that have tried and failed or symptoms, ideas, tools. You have to monitor symptoms and behaviors. 
You have to support their treatment plans, you know, implementing the treatment plans at home, supporting your child to use the journal or take that pill or try that group. You have to provide housing, financial and transportation support, paying for treatment or other supports, driving your child to appointments, picking them up when they get sent home from school. And already that sounds like a lot, right? In some organizations, this might represent six or more different people. But in addition to that, you also might have a full-time job or a part-time job that you're trying to keep. You might have a partner that you want to be a partner to, a husband or a wife. And you probably would love to just be a mom or a dad. And this is all before the pandemic. In these days, you also have to be a teacher, a vaccine hunter, an infectious disease expert, along with probably a playmate, a referee, a whole bunch of other roles that you can, you can think of. As part of our mission at PLEO to amplify the family voice, we ask parents to tell us about what their challenges are, and here's what they share. 90% say they worry about the future. In the 70 percentage, they say they're worried about managing crisis situations, finding services for their child, being able to cope and care for themselves. They're worried about stigma and judgment from others. Are they a bad parent? Is their child a bad kid? And they're worried about being involved as much as they would like in their child's treatment. And the reason I bring all of this up about the different roles and about all of those different challenges parents tell us they're experiencing is again, to point out that if it feels hard, it's not because you're doing it wrong. There is a lot to talk about. There's a lot to worry about. There's a lot on our plates. So again, let's just take 30 seconds. Another deep breath. Acknowledge that yes, this is hard. It's not because you were doing it wrong. You are doing the best you can, one day at a time or one step at a time. You will have ups and downs and that's okay. It's totally appropriate. And the best you can is enough. And now let's talk about a few ways we can make it easier. I have four ideas to share with you. The first is self-care in the everyday. The idea that you can't pour from an empty cup. Michael and Kevin have both provided really great information to help you understand what your child might be experiencing and how you can use that information to take care of them and take care of their needs. And to do that, you're going to need some energy, capacity, resilience, strength, whatever you want to call it. And that's where self-care comes in. I'm sure you have now heard about self-care uh, if you're on Facebook or Twitter, uh, everybody everywhere is telling you self-care, self-care, self-care. And you've probably rolled your eyes or thought to yourself, self-care is for other people who have the time and the luxury. And I'm just trying to get through the day. And I have thought that myself for sure. So it's been a journey for me to learn more about self-care. And I've learned this a lot from all of the staff at Clio who uh, are great at it themselves and help teach the other parents that we work with how to bring it into their everyday. So it doesn't have to mean a day at the spa or a long walk in the woods or a massage or even anything that takes longer than five minutes or costs any money. You know, for sure, grab the chance at any one of these if you can, but I want to help you reframe self-care as a basic necessity in the same category as food and water and sleep and as something that you absolutely can sneak into your day. Already in the past few minutes, we've snuck in some self-care. We've taken a moment and some deep breaths. We've given ourselves recognition and acceptance for things feeling hard. And we've thanked ourselves for doing the best we can. I'll share some other ideas with you of things you can slip into the day, which I promise they help you keep going and they do add up. Walking meetings is my current favorite. We collectively made Zoom meetings our new norm. So the proof is there that we can blow it up and, and try new things. 
We don't need every meeting to be on Zoom. You can turn your camera off. You can attend with audio only. You can make it a call instead. And you can walk outside when you're talking, maybe not for every meeting, but for as many as you can. I had a day last week where I managed 24,000 steps in a day because of all of the walking meetings. And uh, I can tell you it was one of the better days of the week for sure. You can give yourself five minute giving up breaks. And this is something my staff tease me about, but I really think it's quite enjoyable. I do it whenever I have the chance, I make it pretty dramatic. I'll lie down, face down on my bed, as if all I could do was collapse there and say to myself, either out loud or just in my head, I give up, I give up, I'm done. It sounds ridiculous, but the relief of giving up for a few minutes is actually pretty amazing. You can try attaching a self-care habit to a habit that you already have. One of my colleagues has made it an unconscious practice that while she's in the kitchen every morning getting the kids lunches and breakfasts ready, every time she takes a sip of her tea, she glances out the window at the sky or the green on the trees. And another, another colleague that takes a huge sip of water every time an email comes in. You can take one song dance breaks with or without your kids. If it's with your kids or with your partner, you can make it who has the worst dance moves challenge. So you get a good laugh out of it, just like Kevin was suggesting. And these are just a few ideas, but the point is it can be small. It can fit into your everyday. And if you can't get past the idea of it being selfish, know that you are doing this for your kids. They need you to be okay. And they need you to model how they can fit self-care in their day, even without having to call it self-care. They and you will be on your way to internalizing that feeling good, taking breaks, practicing gratitude, being silly are, are all just part of how we do life. My second suggestion is get back to basics. There's a fantastic child psychiatrist at CHEO named Dr. Cheng, who I've been quoting since the early pandemic days when he reminded us all to focus on the basics. This is the go-to advice when things are overwhelming or confusing or when we are in crisis, in other words, today. So for yourself and with your kids, adjust your expectations and allow yourselves to say yes to less, to achieve less, measure success differently. When you think about what you have to do in a day, start with this list. We need to eat and drink water. We need to sleep. We need connection, which right now is so limited, but not impossible. A few minutes of actually just being together, like Michael and Kevin talked about, you know, safe physical connection, FaceTime or texting with loved ones. Sometimes connection feels like too much for me in a day. I just feel like I've, I've had too much already, but not the good kind. So I'll send out maybe five text messages just to my family or friends saying, thinking about you or XO, and that's it. There's no expectation that it turns into a conversation, but it's just connecting in that little way. And every single time I feel better for it. Meaning and purpose is a big one too. And this is a great one to work on with your kids. When we wash our hands or distance, we're helping take care of the whole community. When we take care of ourselves, we take care of the whole family. When we're watering plants, we're taking care of a pet. Or you can find other projects to get involved in, like kindness cards for your neighbors or picking up trash in green spaces. So something that helps you all feel a connection to the bigger picture. You can call it faith or community or nature or whatever works for you but it reminds us that we have meaning and purpose. And of course, the other basic on this list, this is a quiz, self-care. The third idea is a practice of remembering all of the things that are the same. So this is an excellent practice to do together with your kids or on your own. There's so much uncertainty. Things are so different than they were a year ago and they keep changing. And the regular routines and things that we and our kids can count on for a sense of safety and control are really interrupted this year. But what is the same? The sun still rises and sets every day. 
I still tuck you into sleep at night. In the spring, the flowers still come up. We still love each other. It can be incredibly calming for both you and your child. So let's take another 30 seconds now. You can either think through a list of your own or add it in the chat uh, or write it down. Just think of a few things that are still the same that you can count on every day. I'll just time it for about 30 seconds. Maybe your kid will tell you you're still annoying. You're still nagging me to brush my teeth. My fourth idea, ask for help and know that you're not alone. You can't and you need not do this alone. You've met Michael and Kevin. You've heard about the wonderful ways that they are there for you and their organizations are there for you. Michael Dixon and the Rotary Club are looking out for their community and they're there for you. There are so many helpers and really, really wonderful people and organizations in the community available to you. And Plio is here for you, just one phone call away to help. I'll tell you a little bit more about what we do. We were created by parents for parents about 20 years ago to help parents to age 25 whose kids are struggling with mental health, addiction, behavioral challenges. We help them find their way forward and all of our staff are parents who themselves have or are supporting their kids through these same challenges. So what we do is peer support, family peer support. Our staff are going through the same thing that our clients are going through. We have a few ways that we deliver this. We have a parent's helpline, which is available Monday to Friday, nine to seven for anyone in Ontario. We have parent support groups for parents to share information and learn from one another, come together as a community. There are several each week. You can find them on our website. We have mobile one-on-one -on -one support for more intensive support and guidance through particularly challenging times, usually in person and in your community and available like that as we can these days. But otherwise, when we can't meet in person, it's by video and chat and phone. And for all of these services, we do the same thing, which is provide family peer support. We help parents parse what the challenges are, um, understanding concerning symptoms or a diagnosis, we help connect, find and connect to resources, either treatment providers, you know, crossroads or open doors, for example, or things like books and blogs and webinars and things that you can, you can connect to to help your family. Um, we provide support and strategies for coping with life stressors. We share skills to effectively advocate for your child and family's needs. And really, we provide non judgmental understanding support for parents. A lot of parents say when they call us, this is the first time I have felt so heard and understood, and I could just say what I needed to hear. I felt and say what I needed to say, and I felt so supported. Of course, we want to make sure that what we do works and that parents know what we're aiming for by showing them how we measure success. So here's what they tell us. As a result of using our services, about 90% of parents and caregivers say they're better able to cope, they're better able to support their child, they're better able to access the services they need, and they feel less anxious, less stressed, and less isolated. Core to our work is our belief that these families can flourish, no matter how challenging or scary their problems are. We know that it's possible and that flourishing is what we would insist on for our own child and family. What we do, family peer support, is just one important piece of the puzzle. But we also work really closely with schools, clinicians, treatment providers, just as we do with parents because we know that working together supports the best possible experience and outcomes for kids and families. 
So before I pass back to Michael and then to Western Ottawa Community Resource Center, I just want to encourage everyone to take another 30 second break, a deep breath. And let's acknowledge some pretty great news. You've learned valuable information tonight that you will either find immediately actionable or will surprise you sometime in the near future. You've taken a moment to validate that if this feels hard, it's not because you're doing it wrong. Your feelings, your stress, your challenges are okay and they're an appropriate response. There are so many people and organizations here to help you. You're not alone. There are about 80 people on this webinar alone that are going through the same thing. There are small manageable things that you can do to make things a little easier for your kids and your family. You are empowered. You have what you need even to make a small change to get you some, moment, some momentum. And that is very hopeful. I will turn it over to Michael Dixon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elise, so much. Um, <clears throat> one thing that we found with uh, Funeral Professionals Peer Support when we first started the Peer Support Network is that um, people felt that, hey, I'm not alone. I don't, I'm not the only person that has these feelings. So uh, peer support is, uh, is uh, definitely a uh, world or a worthwhile first step in the uh, mental health uh, road that's out there. So thank you so much for your presentation. <clears throat> well, folks, uh, before we, uh, before we uh, um, go into question and answer uh, period, um, we are really, really pleased uh, to have join us tonight uh, Jessica Burns, Child and Youth Counselor, and Aaron Carruthers, Youth Program Coordinator from the Western Ottawa Community Resource Centre, who will take a few minutes and uh, tell us what they offer. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jessica Rose Burns and I work for Western Ottawa Community Resource Centre. I'm the child and youth counselor. Uh, so with that, we offer child and youth counseling in person as well as online for ages to seven to 18 years old. Um, we, are, we are here to discuss kind of everything and anything. It can go from school to anxiety, to depression, support with COVID, any mental health concerns. Um, if this is something you're interested in or think your child or youth would be interested in, um, feel free to give us a call at 613-591-3686, extension 269, and we'll complete an intake and set you up with the first session. I will pass you over to Erin, and she will go over our youth programs we also offer at Western. Hi everybody. Um, I'm Erin. I'm the uh, youth coordinator uh, for the coordinator for the youth programs at Western. Um, currently, we're doing all our programs virtually, but we are uh, sort of starting to discuss how we can possibly um, run some during the summer outside, hopefully. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, we hope to be able to connect in person again soon. Um, so our we have two drop two three drop ins really um, programs. There's the zone, which is for all youth 12 to 18. Uh, the zone rural, which is more important during when we're in person, um, and we have people from sort of the outlying areas of like Fitzroy and Dunrobin and that sort of thing. Um, it runs out of West Carlton High School. Um, and then the Queerios, which is one of our most popular programs. It is an identity affirming program for LGBTQ plus youth. Um, and as I said, they're all currently running online. Um, we also have a couple of structured programs, which are more um, like psychoeducational based. Um, we have, it's called the Zone Next Steps, which is for 18 to 26 year olds. And it's a partnership with us and uh, the Community Employment Resource Center, CERC. Um, we actually have a new session starting next week on Wednesday nights. So if you have any 18 to 26 year olds looking for um, job, some job skills, uh, 
the facilitators uh, do a really good job of, of uh, teaching some of that resume building and, and uh, job searching and networking during uh, social distancing. Um, and then our studio night, which is hugely popular, it's a new program, um, but we sort of sell out of spots really fast. Um, and it's, it's a therapeutic art program uh, for 12 to 18 year olds. Um, so we're using like uh, different art modalities to uh, sort of work on self-care and self-compassion and coping skills, all those really important uh, skills in uh, a time of a pandemic. Um, so yeah, so those are the programs we have right now. Um, we hope to have a couple workshops coming up as well. Um, and yeah. Thanks. <laughs> oh, I'm going to put my email, uh, the youth email in the chat. So if you have anybody who's interested in any of our programs, please feel free to send me an email. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so, uh, so much to both of you. And, uh, and uh, thank you for uh, in including your, uh, your information to us. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, personally used your services uh, over the years with uh, one of my younger children, so we certainly know how valuable your services are. So thank you again so much. Well, folks, uh, now we're into the uh, question and answer uh, portion of the night. Um, so as as we said, there's two ways of doing this. You can uh, you can type in your your information and we can uh, read it out, uh, or you can hit the reaction button as I'm doing, and you see a little hand go up beside uh, name, and uh, we can we can call call on you then. Um, I do have uh, I do have a question, and uh, I'm I'm assume, assuming this is for Michael. But uh, if uh, Elise and Kevin wanted to uh, um, add in, that would be uh, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> hello, having concerns with acting out aggressively by my seven year old grandson who lives with me. Uh, did not does not want to be online learning misses his friends and is getting physical with me when he gets upset. I am trying hard to keep him calm and active, but would like some suggestions on how to handle when they push you or stick out at you. I have had him in counseling before the pandemic and I'm trying to get him back in. Any suggestions would really be appreciated. Sure, I can give a uh... A, a stab at it then um so i guess the, a, a couple things one i think if, if um one of the ways you could get access more quickly to talk to somebody about this would be through counseling connect and i'll put it in shortly not you can directly book in with us at crossroads um for a, a session to sort of dive into it further but based on just the, the basics that you gave me a couple things i'd suggest is one um, think about where that's happening most often. So is it is it during online learning time? Is it uh, leading up to online learning time? Is it at some other point during the day? And the next moment you have where, where the, the seven-year-old is in a calm state, have a conversation with them about what had gone on, not about the behavior of the, the, the aggressive behavior, but more about uh, what was happening when it was time to come to dinner or when it was time to sit down for online learning to better understand what was triggering the, those actions so that you can actually do something about it. So until we, you know, the, the, the way to sort of think about it is until you actually understand what the problem is, you really can't solve it, right? So, and behavior is typically a symptom of something bigger. So the, something bigger is, is, you know, what led up to the, that behavior that we witness, and so it's better to sort of start there to better understand what's going on. And then, obviously, you would you'd come up with solutions related to whatever that that issue was um, that you learned through the conversation. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, just in the comment section, Karen is saying, uh, listening to uh, Michael talk about uh, fight flight freeze, I realize my young son is having issues with the uh, flight 
since this lockdown started, he is having unusual uh, aggressive behavior, screaming that we have not had to deal with before. And I am trying to nip this in the bud and give him strategies to take action when he is uh, feeling that way. But uh, he is only five and sometimes he goes from one to 100 right away. And I'm sure that's certainly something, Michael, you you hear a lot from uh, from other parents. Yeah, absolutely. And if, if it's a big enough change, Karen, in the last while, then it's probably wise to, to come in if, if you're in the R where you come in and, and see us at Crossroads and we can talk a bit more about sort of what, what's going on so that you can put in place some strategies to address it so that it's, it, it reduces the frequency. And then I'm sure Elise uh, might have something to add to this as well. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right up my alley too. I also have a five-year-old, but it is something that we hear a lot about from um, from parents that we talk through from parents and we've learned some really great sort of principles around this about this from our partners like Crossroads and the idea of collaborative problem solving. I think, um, you know, the big takeaway for me around this one is the idea of um, connect before direct. So in that moment, um, when your child is in that fight response and having an outburst or screaming or whatever it is, kind of give up on whatever it is you're trying to get them to do or what, you know, if they're supposed to be getting their clothes on to go outside or, you know, whatever it is and just, you know, give them some physical space, but stay close and say, I hear you. I, I see you're upset. I hear you just validate that they are, that you acknowledge you're there and you acknowledge what they're going through. Um, when they're outside of that, you know, when they're not in the heat of it, and maybe when you're doing something like walking or playing or making dinner or eating something that's not, you know, sitting right across from each other and feeling kind of intimidating, you can talk about, you know, I noticed before you got really upset and that seemed really hard for you. Um, what is it that you want me to know? What is it that you wanted me to know about what was going on there? And, and try to find a chance to talk about it and dig into it. Like, like Michael is saying, you know, to get some more information, what do you want me to know about what was difficult? And okay, what do you want? What would be helpful next time? Let's come up with a plan for how I can support you and what you can do too. So maybe instead of screaming, you could try stomping your feet or, um, using a pillow or, you know, having some kind of fidget tool or just saying, I need an alone time, or I need you to squeeze me really, really tight. Um, or I need you to remind me to do this, but, you know, come up with the, when kids get older or, or when there's more complex, um, mental health issues, we sometimes call it like a safety plan where you identify what triggers are going to be and, and how you're going to prepare for it in advance. And that, um, approach makes a lot of sense to me with my with my little one too to say okay we know some of these things are going to be hard let's work together um you tell me how it would be helpful to support you I can give you some ideas too so it's not something that you would get an immediate change with um but it might be something you get some help with over time and for sure as Michael said it's you know if it's a big change in behavior it's worth reaching out never it never hurts to get more information or to get a professional opinion about if it's something that would would benefit from you know working with a professional great thank you uh thank you so much i just want to uh, uh remind folks that you can uh unmute yourselves now and uh again you can uh, certainly ask ask questions if you wish uh we we have another Another question for all three of you. Um, um, what are the strategies to work with technology addiction in teens, preteens, when in this pandemic? Kids need to be online more than uh, ever for learning and also as a way to connect with friends. With this in mind, what tech boundaries would you recommend for this age group? And Michael, did you want to start? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a so 
I think that the, the biggest challenge at the moment is the sort of the push towards using all the all these devices, right? And so I think there's some, and then I, you know, I, I'm thinking about um, at least your slide where you talked about all the functions, all the roles of a parent at the same time. So um, I think, I definitely think it needs to be balanced. There needs to be some sort of structure and routine and expectations around it. Um, I think, you know, unfortunately, I think it's used a little bit and, and needs to be at this point used a little bit as a tool sometimes so that you, you know, the, the parents can do something. It's about balancing it so that it's not um, sort of overuse of that. I, I think the other, uh, the other piece I'd add is, is, you know, because that's occurring and that's being used and making sure that there's um, outdoor activities and other sorts of activities that are sort of front and center and part of the expectation and routine within the, within the, the household. This is kind of where, where I go. Great. Uh, Kevin, uh, Kevin and or Elise, did you have uh, anything to add with that? Well, uh, Elise had mentioned uh, Dr. Chang at, at uh, CHEO, and one of his areas of expertise is dealing with overuse of technology. And, and if you if you look up Dr. Chang, um, uh, he has a lot of material that's for free that you can access uh, to uh, provide you with some some guidance and and some some uh, assistance with with these kinds of issues, and I and I really think in addition to what Michael's saying, and certainly in agreement with what Dr. Chang would be suggesting, is that um, the 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 technology um, cannot become a substitute for a relationship with with uh, people. Uh, within the family, within peers, et cetera, and, and being able to assist them through the sorts of things that we have discussed, looking at it from a, a, a family uh, a relational perspective so that, so that there is opportunity to better understand and share ideas about what is desirable, what, what, what the, the preferences are, understanding what's going on with the, the child or youth to to appreciate um, where they're coming from, and and helping to problem solve what is the problem lying uh, um, that that's driving the behavior, um, and not get caught with the the notion that the technology itself is. But there's 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 something that that the technology is being substituted for, and how can how can we help replace that? At least I turn it over to you at this point. Yeah, thanks. Um, I agree for sure about um, checking out Dr. Chang or or Chio. There's, you know, there's some documents there that have some specific, you know, guidelines. You know, at this age, this many hours a day. Mm -hmm. They don't apply during a pandemic. I'm say, I'm just putting that out there, and and for good reason. I mean, there's screen time that you have to do for school, but there's also, you, as a parent or a caregiver, sometimes you you need you need the screen to babysit for a little while or your or your child needs some kind of interaction um but given that um which is you know some permission from your for yourself but also knowing that this won't go on forever um that as kevin said you know there are things you can do to um kind of balance out um screen time with making sure all of the other important stuff gets in there too um there are some creative ways to kind of achieve what you would with the screen without having to have a screen or without having to be on camera like even just being on camera can can feel quite stressful um so if teachers allow for example turning the camera off uh during online learning can be helpful um uh for younger kids but maybe for older kids too my personal experience is with younger kids um, we found, you know, audiobooks and podcasts and things can be a nice replacement for screen time and more likely to, you know, more likely to find my son listening to something, but then kind of playing while he's listening or acting it out or, um, you know, getting that kind of delivered entertainment without having to be in front of a screen or more interactive screen things like games. And there's some good learning games and, um, you know, some developmentally appropriate games. I'm not suggesting you no know, first person shooter games or anything like that but um 
you know, there's some great alphabet games or, or whatever it is that's appropriate. Um, even for the, you know, the screen time that's with grandparents who are trying to stay connected, there's some really uh, great resources for kind of interactive things you can do with your grandkids, um, where, you know, reading books where they're flipping the pages by clicking or swiping and um, just kind of to the point of what Michael and Kevin were saying, try to find a way for it to be connection also. Um, you're going to have to use it sometimes. It's not the end of the world. Um, and there's there's some, kind of some creative ways to fill that gap of needing that babysitting um, entertainment um, without it always having to be, you know, YouTube or Netflix or something. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. You know, one one area that I think a lot of parents have, have had to deal with uh, from time to time and, and especially for newer parents, um, maybe younger kids, uh, it's uh, tough for them to wrap their head around, is the issue of bullying. Uh, bullying within our, uh, uh, within our school systems, our uh, sports we play on in the playground. Uh, you know, I kind of, uh, Kevin, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, our, our kids are watching us and, and, you know, I, I, I think back to, you know, they're probably watching the way we're treating each other. I'm wondering if, uh, one or, the, or three of you can, can uh, talk about, uh, uh, bullying and, and, um, kind of what are the signs when your child is being bullied and, uh. Uh, what um, what areas can you go to to get to, to get help? Um, so in terms of, in terms of bullying, um, well, there, there, you know, there's a, there's so many different types now than than sort of historically, right? Yeah. Um, so I think it, you know, it, it's one of those things that you want to sort of check into if there's like sudden changes, like a, a fear of going to school or, or all of a sudden a fear of, you know, if it's about some, some sort of game they play, all of a sudden they don't want to log in and, and play that game. Like I know, I don't know anything about this stuff, but, but, it, but you know what I mean? Like, like Neither do I. <laughs> um, those sorts of things, I think, uh, like they, they, they're, they're telling you something, they're communicating something. And so then it's about trying to figure out what that something might be. The, um, you know, having, and just having like, and I think if you go back to sort of some of the stuff that we talked about, you've got that connectedness, you've got that routine of touching base and those sorts of things established, then you can use those to try to uncover what's going on and providing a safe space for that, that conversation to happen and, and sort of reassuring you're not in trouble, really just trying to understand what's going on for you um, at school, at, you know, whatever the, whatever the particular situation is to uncover. Um, what's happening and then obviously to to then try to address those those concerns that whatever those concerns might be very good thank you um just uh going to the comments section uh, at least could you kindly share some of the online resources you suggested uh facetime story time with grandparents for example yeah, I saw that question and I'm frantically looking up the names. Of the I'll, I'll <laughs> Did you want me to go them. back to you later? Yeah, I'll try and find them and put them in the chat. Okay, great. Yeah. great. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Rebecca. Uh, what effect do you think the pandemic will have on youth development? Whoops. Uh, what, I lost my screen, but now it's back. On uh, developmentally... Uh, do you think this generation will be delayed emotionally or mentally more so than older generations? So is this pandemic is, a, you know, are we, are we going to see uh, some, some, some changes uh, uh, mentally compared to other generations? Um, I can pass that on to uh, all of you or just one of you who, Whoever wants to jump in, well, I'll, I'll jump. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, 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 uh, I'll give the other two time to think. <laughs> uh, 
there, there, there is research cer certainly that that's suggesting that that uh, there are going to be challenges with uh, with younger kids. Um, I, I've read some recent literature about um, um, infants who look to their parents uh, uh, around speech, and because masks are being worn, it there's an interruption with uh, developmental stages in in terms of speech. I I'm not a speech path or or that's not my area, but but you can certainly understand where that was going to be uh, um, a, a, an area where there may be some challenges. Uh, if there's somebody else on on the call that uh, could speak to that, that'd be fascinating to learn. Um, I I I, re I really think that that um, um, part of the reason that I would say that this is the, 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 it may not be the case that there would be um, any kind of delays. Um, and where I'd come from with that is that, as has been said so many times, uh, th these are really challenging times. And challenging times are opportunities to develop resilience. Challenging times are, are opportunities to develop uh, ways to be able to deal with adversity. And um, part, part of what we're talking about is is being able to create conditions whereby parents are given permission to a talk about the way it is don't sugarcoat it but don't dwell on it focus on on the things that we are able to accomplish focus on what it is that we're doing well and uh all the things that we can uh, uh do with all the opportunities to show that we care about the world we can make a difference in the world that we can care about other people you know we talk you know you look around your neighborhoods you see people walking more they're not sitting on the screen they're going for a walk you see people uh taking taking uh dinners to people across the street uh, people are helping others when they go and get their groceries, uh, and 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 as we've we've said all along, kids are watching this and they're seeing this is this this is how people work through adversity. They're there for each other. They've got each other's backs. So while while there may be some challenge, certainly in some areas of the, of of, uh, of development going forward, um, the way that we show how we are doing well with it will be informing the children about how they take care of themselves and others at times of adversity. That's what I'd offer. Great, thank you. Um, so we, we, uh, we have a, uh, uh, a question. Um, so as a parent, I struggle with keeping tech boundaries in the house when my boys and peers have no tech boundaries in their homes. As <laughs> parents, we all know what that's like. And uh, can access tech at any time of the day and late into the night. So I struggle with my teen boy <clears throat> who has a fear of missing out. Um, you know, my, my kids are much older now, but, uh, you know, we, we certainly had that issue when our three were younger where, you know, so-and-so down the street is allowed to do something and our kids aren't. And, uh, uh, how would you, how would you address that sort of thing, uh, to anyone on the panel? Uh, yeah, I'll give it sure. a shot. Sure, go ahead. Well, I'll take up first. Kevin took the last one. I'll take okay. this one. It's a it's a really tough one, um, and I'll I'll use what I think is um, kind of a a transferable idea, which is talking to kids about um, using drugs, because um, parents will have different ideas about what's okay or not okay, and kids will have different ideas about what's okay or not okay. Uh, and you can get stuck in the debate about are drugs okay or not, or is screen time okay or not, or is technology okay or not? And and your kids might win. They're probably very good at debating. They're teenagers, and um, and that's not the issue. That's not what's at hand. It's um, 
there's nothing wrong with technology. Technology is amazing. Um, being able to connect with your friends are amazing. What is that issue here is the effect that it has on you and your well-being and what goes on in our family. So, you know, maybe maybe it's okay for your friend or maybe not feeling okay is okay for your friend. Uh, or you never know what's going on with that family or your friend, but all that's important right now is is your your well-being and your okayness. Um, and that's what that's what we're talking about here. It's not whether or not tech is good um, and how much how much you can use it, but about what level of okayness and connection and whatever else you're missing by by using it late at night, like sleep, um, has on you. Uh, the other part of this that's probably um, less palatable to think about is how we're modeling it for our own kids. So um, are we are we briefly looking away from our own screen to say turn your screen off? Um, or lying in bed with the blue light shining out of our, our room um, late into the night. And uh, it can be a good motivator to, to have our own good habits about it. Um, and then the other kind of last piece I, I would think of, and again, this is kind of just off the top of my head, but um, you know what, if, when I've had similar conversations or, or heard from parents about similar conversations about all manners of things where you're where your your kids are comparing to what other kids have or don't have, you can say, yeah, let's think about that. Let's think about how what you have is different from that child. And let's think about the whole spectrum about kids who don't have any access to technology or connection to people or kids who aren't allowed to use it at all. And, you know, different things for different kids and different families. And thank goodness for that. Thank goodness that, you know, there's a place for everybody in this world and for what you need specifically in this world. But, you know, everybody has a different approach to it. Yeah, very, uh, very true. Um, uh, you you had brought up uh, uh, drugs or drug abuse or drug use and, and, and that kind of... Um, ties into uh the next question or my next question i i have um you know we see uh the rapid numbers of of uh of uh, deadly drugs that are being used you know uh, fentanyl and prescription drugs that uh that are uh, being stolen um i think uh people would be in Ottawa would be very shocked to know the amount of uh, uh, suicides uh, there are due to drug abuse in this uh, in this area, uh, not only in Ottawa, but Lanark. Um, and uh, wondering if all three of you uh, or um, one of you would be able to to address the uh, the drug crisis we we have in the city, and I'm not just talking about marijuana. I'm I'm, I'm talking about heavier drugs than that that are uh, uh, that are much stronger, and uh, there seems to be more of it uh, even since I was in college. So so, so Michael, just to clarify. When you say you'd like us to address it, um, can you help me to understand uh, uh, in what manner you'd like us to address it? Well, just uh, just the amount that's out there and uh, what what parents uh, uh, can do to get help. What are the warning signs that uh, uh, some some parents can uh, can can see? Okay. Um, well, um, at the risk of repeating ourselves, um, Open Doors for Lanark Children and Youth is involved with a project in Lanark County called Planet Youth Lanark County. And Planet Youth is a global um, um, uh, social intervention uh, to decrease the use of uh, drugs, uh, substance misuse uh around the globe and it started in iceland and is sometimes called the the icelandic prevention model uh sometimes it's called the the icelandic model uh, uh, and it's an evidence-based program that has over 20 years of of evidence that shows that indeed when you implement this project 
um, it does reduce the amount of substance misuse within whatever the geographic location is. And we are looking to implement it in Lanark County. Um, uh, part, part, of, part of the project um, is based upon um, uh, gathering data from grade 10 students. There's a, there's a proprietary questionnaire that, that is completed, uh, 80 questions or thereabouts. And it talks about things like um, uh, how well they feel connected with peers, how well they feel connected with parents, uh, what kind of opportunities exist for them in the community for pro-social activities, and and that kind of uh, how, how do they feel about things are going how going at school, and when you look at at the kinds of questions that it's asking, it's asking what is the social context in which you reside, and what kind of support is it do is it providing so that you feel like you are being honored as an individual, and that people care about you. The interventions that come from that are are not are not um, plug and play. They're they're created from the data that's cre that is uh, collected and, and analyzed, and that community then creates opportunities to through the development of protective factors that are going to under um, undermine or or mitigate the the, the risk factors. So in some of the countries that that this has been implemented, you get things like. Um, uh, engaging in more time between parents and kids, uh, creating opportunities for the arts, creating opportunities for sports, transportation, uh, opportunities for um, um, meaningful uh, social engagement within the community. And, and, and if you hear the theme that, that Michael and Elise have, have, been, have been sharing today, it's about how does this individual um, not only um, have internal resources to be able to stand up to adversity, but what's the social environment doing to assist them to do that? How, how is there a social context that this individual can, um, can, can um, successfully overcome challenges and be resilient? So, so when you ask, you know, what's going on? There's an awful lot of disconnection out there. There's an awful lot of people who um, don't feel like someone cares about them genuinely, um, and they and they look for ways to be able to overcome those feelings of disconnection, um, sadness, uh, depression, um, and uh, they find themselves getting into a very um, uh, um, vicious cycle. Uh, downward cycle that 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 does not provide them with the way out, but they get they get stuck, and it becomes their way to try and buy a few minutes of release, as you mentioned earlier uh, yourself, Michael, about being able to get away from the pain. Biologically, we just want to get away from pain and get the pleasure, whatever that however that is defined, and if and if people can use something artificial they're going to try that if they can access it. The real genuine kind of uh, uh, pleasure that, that Elise and Michael and I have been speaking about today is feeling that genuine sense of connection. Someone cares about you, you care about someone else, and you're making a difference in the world in a, in a way that helps you to feel like you have your own personal power, you have your own ability to make a difference. And it's that interaction that uh, b between all these factors that really does um, um, help to create opportunities for drugs to not be as significant a role in society. And Elise and Michael, you know, welcome your contributions as well. No, I, don't, I wouldn't, there's nothing for me to add. I think you covered it nicely, Kevin. Thanks for this. Yeah, I, I would just add that as uh, parents or anyone kind of in a parenting role, it can be this can be so terrifying. Um, and one of the ways to kind of handle that is get lots of information. Um, if you're hearing about it, your kids probably heard about it a while ago. Um, so you it's okay to talk to them about it. You're probably not introducing them to anything new. 
um, look up uh, because of some of the really scary um, drugs uh, that are going around and the opioid crisis, um, find out about naloxone, um, get yourself a naloxone kit if it's appropriate for, you know, what you're seeing at home. And uh, you can look it up uh, online. You can get one at, I think, just about every pharmacy and the pharmacist can explain how and when you use it and you might want to equip your kid with it. Um, it's not uh, it's not crazy to to think that think that think that far through what might happen. Um, there there are real challenges. Um, the the other thing I would say is that there are a lot of really really great resources available for figuring everything from figuring out how to talk to your kids about um, drugs to um, trying to help your kids or loved ones through addiction. Um, and there are different approaches that I think make sense at different age, at different ages. Um, you know, the AA and NA groups that a lot of people know about, some, some people think make more sense for adults um, and not as much sense for young people who, uh, as a first step, don't want to give up control um, or, you know, give up and, or, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the, on the phrase right now, but, um, give over to, to a higher power. Um, so you can, for sure, if you're concerned about this or in the thick of it, you can be in touch with Clio, um, and we can help connect you to some of the resources to get more information or some of the services to help you. Uh, the other one I would look at, look at if you're kind of into this already, you're concerned about your child or your loved one's addiction is smart recovery, S M A R T recovery. Um, Cleo, we run a group um, with uh, Sandy Hill Community Health Center uh, for um, loved ones, so for family and friends uh, of people who are struggling with um, addiction or substance use or um, you know addictive behaviors. That can be really helpful in terms of understanding what they might be going through. And the last, um, kind of in, in the same um, uh, theme as what Michael was talking about, and you know going using books uh, as an example of a way to talk to a kids uh, about emotions um, and different ways of expressing their emotions, depending on the age of your kid. If, if they're older, there might be movies or something that are appropriate to watch somebody else's experience. Um, they can be really, you know, devastating movies, but I think uh, there's one called Beautiful Boy or um, um, I'm blanking on some of the other names right now but you can watch it together and then use it as a tool to talk about what do you think happened there? and What was going on for that kid yeah. and that yeah. family and just um, talk about it. Don't be afraid to talk about it. Good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question actually, it's for you, Elise. I have a 23 year old son that uh, graduated when he was 17 and you know, still stays at home and still stays in his basement, has no motivation to uh, get an education or job. Uh, I don't, uh, do, you, do you have any uh, suggestions on, on how to get this young man motivated? That's a good question. Um, so I can tell you kind of what the conversation would look like if, uh, if you called into the, the PLEO helpline and we're speaking to one of our family peer supporters, we'd probably ask kind of what are they like when, what's your son like when he's at his best? Um, is there anything that kind of happened in between when he was 17 and now that was particularly upsetting? Um, you know, has there been a major change in behavior, a major change in um, peer group or you know, what's, what's different now? It's kind of pinpoint what some of the changes have been. Um, I think I would also, there'd be a conversation about, you know, there are a lot of different things that contribute to a quality of life. Uh, if you look up the World Health Organization's um, definition of quality of life, and, and this is repeated in a lot of places, you see things like, um, you know, physical well-being, emotional well-being, um, things around employment or volunteer work, uh, social connectedness, spirituality. Um, and I think what's really hopeful and helpful about that idea of quality of life is that 
if you can get momentum in any one of those areas, uh, there's kind of a ripple effect. So maybe what you want for your son is to get a job um, or to go to school, um, but he just can't find the motivation to do that. But maybe uh, you can get a dog and <laughs> you can start by walking the dog. Um, and getting more physical activity and getting more connection with another creature. And then maybe it turns into, um, you know, taking up one more responsibility or finding something that he's interested in that he doesn't have to take too seriously. It doesn't have to be a course. It doesn't have to be paying job, but it's, um, you know, something to get connected to, to show up reliably for to be accountable for just to kind of get some momentum in different areas of life um, I can think of a particular example with one of our family peer supporters um, and there was a young girl who who was about 17 and it was a similar kind of challenge and and the mom kind of in passing had mentioned mentioned that the child really loved drawing and they came up with an idea for the child um, to create a comic book um, about what she was experiencing and it turned into a big project and got momentum and then she got connected to this kind of comic book um, uh, social you know peer group and you just never know where those things would lead um, and the other thing I would suggest is kind of you're allowed to have boundaries you're allowed to have expectations in your home um, and you're allowed to enforce them um, and think about you know the ways that you might be enabling the behavior too um, you know, can you say, you know, my expectation is that you have to do this one thing. If you want to, you know, stay in my house, you have to, you know, we're, we're shutting off the internet after whatever hour it's, it's really, you know, I don't want to suggest that specifically. It really depends on your kid and your family rules and what you think is appropriate and safe. But, um, I would say there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity to find a way to spark some excitement and some future orientation and some connection and 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 get to that motivation in in maybe less obvious pathways yeah you know we i uh always tell the story when uh, in regards to our uh, our daughter our, our our first child um and i just kind of laugh about it now but it wasn't funny then uh she you know, when she graduated high school she went to she wanted to be a lawyer so she was off she went to uh Carleton university and you know mom and dad you know handed in the money and halfway through it yeah i don't want to do this anymore so mom and dad you know, and then you know and then oh i'd like to be a vet so okay off we go and yeah i don't want to do that anymore so but third time we said okay <laughs> your third choice has to be a and she became a nurse and she's flourishing in it and uh you know when your kids finally find um uh their passion you know they just lighten up and their eyes brighten and it's just so amazing so uh what you say is very true um folks if there's uh if there's no other uh questions uh at this point i'm gonna ask uh uh i'm gonna ask our Stitzel rotary president david rook to uh uh to uh come in and just uh just uh to say some words um uh, before we sign off for the night thank you michael um it's a, a great pleasure to have this can you hear me all right yep okay it's a great pleasure to have uh this team that you've suggested and assembled uh, uh here with us elise and kevin and michael and our two ladies from the um, Western Ottawa Community Resource Centre, Jessica Rose and Aaron, also to compliment. I, I was really impressed by the way the three major presenters uh, linked all the bits and pieces of this together. I thought it was very complimentary. And I can't imagine uh, that uh, people who came here wondering what to do in certain circumstances uh, didn't collect some really good, useful uh, information from the pre presentations. Um, I, I like the interaction very much. And um, I was particularly, uh, you know, this, this business of connecting with others 
and uh, has really taken some roots in our club as well, uh, where during this pandemic, uh, there was a, a group that, a connecting group got together and they send cards and we've had buddy weeks and we've had, you know, where you're just uh, somebody you wouldn't normally connect with in the, in the club and you go and have coffee or you, you meet in your garage or you go for a walk or something like that. And uh, we send cards and and flowers and things like that to people who are shut in and all. It's so it's it's there's so many levers I guess that you can use out there. Uh, but on on behalf of all those, you know, we had a really good um, uh, group here to start with. We had about 87, and it tells me that uh, it's a time it, it's a time thing. We all get Zoom fatigue, I guess. Um, we're down to about half of that right now, but I'm really grateful for the the information that was presented to our members and on behalf of the Stittsville Rotary Club and the members who who have have all signed up and come along. I I, I thank you all very very much. Uh, much needed service in our community. Thank you on behalf of all of us. Thank you, David, very much. Uh, before we close for the evening, I just wanted to uh, give you the websites of, uh, of our uh, three presenters, uh, and you can certainly get more information. Uh, Pillow is uh, www.pleo.on.ca. Crossroads is crossroadschildren.ca. Open Doors is www.opendoors.on. .ca. Um, just a reminder, uh, folks, that our next presentation is this Thursday at 7 p.m. The topic will be redefining masculinity with the host of Life in Red podcast and award-winning speaker and advocate, Ryan Forsyth. Uh, <clears throat> there might be uh, a few spots uh, available as of tonight, so if you can register tonight or register before Thursday uh, at, at the Stitzville Rotary website, uh, we'd, be, uh, we'd be appreciative and you can reserve your spot. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope you know that whatever you're dealing with in life, you're not alone. And, and that's definitely what we heard here tonight. Professionals are just a phone call or an, e or an email away. So my friends, just in closing, remember, we as a community, we as a people, we need each other and we have to start caring for one another. Thank you very much. Good night and stay safe.